On this episode, we dig deep into Thailand's history with a look at former Prime Minister Plek Pibun Songkram. So if you're interested in one of the most unusual personalities that helped shape modern Thailand, you'll dig this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawati crap and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 and misses his family only slightly more than autumn. True story. <laughs> and I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 17 years ago, fell in love with Thai ghost mythology, and never left. Nice. All right. Well, before we start, a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Uh, for more info on how you can become a patron, just head over to the support page on BangkokPodcast.com. And this is the part of the show where we usually tell you what we did on our bonus episode, but because of a few technical difficulties and the fact that this regular episode is such a long-ass episode in and of itself, uh, there won't be a bonus episode this week, unfortunately. Apologies for that, but we will be back to our regular schedule next week. However, for patrons, uh, there is a quick little bonus video that I put up on the uh, Patreon page where I make a video inside of a really cool temple and features a cameo appearance by a demon's nutsack. So uh, that's something. All right. Well, before we jump into it, a few really quick shout outs. Uh, First to Ed, not you, Ed, but another Ed, uh, who alerted me that the QR code on our website that links to our line account wasn't working. So I fixed that uh, right away. Um, And then to Chris, who just today became our, check this out, he became our 300th friend online. Yeah, so uh, so thanks thanks for the heads up, Ed, and welcome to the Line group, Chris, and uh, everyone. If you are not a member of Line, go ahead and check that out. You can scan the QR code now. It works. Uh, cool. <laughs> and uh, speaking of Line, also really just for fun, uh, I was digging around on Line today, and I noticed that uh, it has some demographic breakdowns there. I noticed that sixty seven percent of those three hundred followers are male, and thirty three percent are female. Interesting. I wonder if. That's the actual breakdown of expats in Thailand. Ooh, that's an interesting extrapolation. Yeah, there does seem to be more uh, expat males than females. Would you agree? I think that's probably true. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, I mean. We should probably do a show on the difference between being a, a foreign male in Thailand or a foreign female. What do you think about that? I, I've I've been working on it, yeah. But it's it's to be honest, it's hard to get a Farang lady to come on and talk about that. Um, but it's something that I'm trying to find someone to to do. I'm, ta- okay. I'm talking to a few people, and they've got friends too. So we'll put that in the bank. We'll put that little teaser out there, uh, and maybe we'll do that on a future show. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, on on this episode, we wanted to dip our toe into something that we hope will be an ongoing series uh, on the podcast which is looking back at some of the interesting or important events from Bangkok's history. Now, we realize that not everyone is a history nerd like Ed and I are, but Bangkok, and of course the rest of Thailand, obviously, uh, has some really, really fascinating historical touchstones, all of which play a huge part in the development of Thailand as it stands today, and which most foreigners here, I would wager, have only a passing familiarity with. So as we go forward, we're going to be looking at some of the interesting events, people, places, or little-known stories that we find really interesting. And um, for our first show, we thought we would start with one of the most interesting and controversial people in Thailand's recent history, a dude by the name of Black Pibun Songkram. Yeah, um, uh, a couple uh, introductory points. Uh, first off, my tie is horrible. Uh, I think Greg would probably admit that his tie is bad too, which means we're probably going to mispronounce people's names and events and places. So we apologize for that. Um, <laughs> and and then there's also another problem of just like tie names in general, uh, especially uh, back in history. Like Thai people didn't necessarily have clear first names or last names, and sometimes they got titles added, and then sometimes they changed their name. So. Uh, the gentleman we're going to talk about is a former prime minister of Thailand. Um, and I think in, to keep it simple, we're just going to call him a uh, Pibun. Pibun. Uh, so I think uh, amongst, especially among foreigners, I think he's generally called uh, Pibun, Prime Minister Pibun. 
And um, I'm going to kind of give a basic intro, and then Greg's going to uh, chime in with some interesting facts and ask me some questions. So uh, the basic story of, of Pibun, Pibun Songkram is that he was a military guy. Um, and in, uh, in 1932, as most people know, there was a, a bloodless coup that ended up converting Thailand from a, an absolute monarchy to a democracy, or at least that's what it was supposed to do. And in this uh, bloodless coup in 1932, there was a civilian faction, uh, w- which was led by a couple different people. But one of them was a guy named Pretty Banomyong, who would go on to found Thomasite University. Um, and then um, Pibun was one of the leaders of the military faction. Uh, so he was part of the, the People's Party uh, that, that, that led the coup. But, uh, you know, um, only in Thailand could you have a coup where essentially the king agreed, you know, to convert Thailand to a democracy, which is basically why it was a bloodless coup. That 1932 coup was sort of one of the seminal defining moments of modern Thailand. Um, sort of one of one of the big events in the entire history of the country, so it's a really big deal. No doubt, of course. Um, to me, it was it's a very Thai event because uh, there was no like major fighting, and and the king uh, basically said that he he himself wanted to convert the country to democracy. So it's basically like both sides agreed, you know. So it was like a, in a way, it was it was a coup, but it was uh, an unusual an unusual one where like both sides agreed, hey, we want to convert to democracy. It took a, it took time for the country to make this conversion, and the king at that time became upset with all the politics and the difficulties, and he ended up abdicating the throne. So he is the only Thai king to ever abdicate to 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 quit the throne, and so he is King Rama the seventh. So King Rama the seventh abdicated and left Thailand, um, and what that meant is that um, King Rama the eighth. Uh, would become king, but at the time, King Rama VIII was a young boy in school in Switzerland, and under mm-hmm. Thai law, what that meant is that there would be some regents, like some advisors, assigned to speak for the king until he was old enough. So essentially, what you have in like the 1930s is you have a period where um, this new civilian government uh, kind of had free reign to try to set up a democratic government. Right, and in this kind of unusual situation for Thailand, you know, which had been an absolute monarchy for, you know, 700 years or something like that. Um, Basically, what happened is uh, this impending uh, war, so obviously this is pre-World War II, this impending war led the military faction, led by Pibun, to kind of gain the upper hand over the civilian faction. And essentially, more or less, in 1938, the military took over the government under the argument that war is coming. You know, the Japanese were invading Asia. Uh, they were potentially going to invade Thailand. And so the, the Thai military essentially took over. Yeah, 1938 was a big year. Germany was making a lot of noise. No one was sure what was going to happen next. Of course, World War II breaks up in 1939. So a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, people playing chess on the global chessboard. No doubt. And what, what basically what happened in Thailand is the... The conversion to democracy was messy and it was taking a lot of time and there was tons of politics going on. And uh, eventually the Thai military was like, hey, we can't mess around with this. Like, you know, war is coming. Like war is on the on, on our doorsteps. And so Pibun is going to become prime minister um, in 1938. He is just a fascinating guy. I'm not going to offer any opinion on whether he was good for Thailand or bad for Thailand. Like this podcast has nothing to do with whether... I like him or not like him. All I can say is all I've read about him is he's fascinating. He's like not a normal guy. But in a way, I do think he's kind of like a Trumpian figure in that like, you know, whether you love Trump or hate Trump, he's not a normal guy. Like he's an unusual character. (laughs) No one thinks he's a normal guy. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like no one thinks that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. And especially in Thailand where politics is so divisive. I mean, like it is in a lot of other places too, but when you're talking about a person with this much influence and this much, uh, who had this much sort of say in which direction country, the country of Thailand developed, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of people take one side, a lot of people take the other side. Some people hate him, some people love him, but whatever, that's not our place. But you're right, though he was he was a very magnetic figure, an interesting figure, an unusual person. Like his his father was a Chinese immigrant who had a durian orchard up uh, just north of Bangkok. 
So he he wasn't didn't come from a rich family or anything like that. And that's that's where he came from. And he went to the Thai Army Academy, and that's how he became sort of involved in the military. But definitely an interesting dude. You know, just as kind of an intro, like to, to understand like how unusual this guy was, I have to mention one of his kind of partners. Um, and his 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 advisor, and I think he technically was was the minister of propaganda. Believe it or not, I think Thailand had a minister of propaganda. Um, and he's a guy named Luang Wichit Watakan. And I think he's known just by his name, uh, Wichit. I'm down with that. Pibun and Wichit, got it. Yeah, Pibun and Wichit. So Wichit is like the minister of propaganda guy. And here's how unusual um, Pibun and Wichit were. They became fascinated by the fascist leaders in Europe, um, by Hitler, but in particular, apparently Mussolini. So for some reason, Pibun and Wichit became fans of Mussolini and Mussolini's style of rule. And essentially, they tried to copy it. Nice. It sounds crazy. Like they basically were pro fascism and they tried to create uh, a Thai fascism. No, that's interesting because, I mean, what we've seen over the past 10 years is that they've tried to sort of identify what Thai democracy is. That's right. That's exactly and, right. You know, the argument is, you know, democracy is democracy. It doesn't, you know, you can't have different versions of it. So, as, you know, some people say. So it's interesting that that, that concept goes way back to before World War II. <laughs> You know, fascism is one of those political terms. It doesn't have a super clear meaning, but there are like, it, basically, here's how I would define it. Fascism is a type of dictatorship that involves like a cult of personality. So it tends to revolve around like a powerful, like charismatic figure that they tend to promote. You know, it's like, and so apparently, right. apparently if you were in Thailand in like 1939 or 1940, apparently there were pictures of Pibun like all over the place. You know, just like we think of like, North Korea with Kim Jong Un's image everywhere. Apparently, that's how Bangkok was, like in 1939 and 1940. So, Pibun's image is everywhere. It's a cult of personality. Um, right. But um, fascism is also very nationalistic, especially when it comes to ethnicity and race. Uh, so, fascism tends to uh, focus on trying to purify a country and and uh, like make it ethnically or racially pure. And uh, okay. so, so basically, Pibun and Wichit, they wanted to define what Siam was. So here, you know, we're talking, you know, 1938. Thailand was not called Thailand. It was called Siam. I, I love that name, man. I've always been a big fan of Siam. It, it's funny you mention that. And this is a little bit of a divergence. But if I could, I'm no, you know, this will never happen, of course. But if I could make two changes in Thailand, it's like, oh, yeah. I would I would go back to the name Siam. I love the name Siam. And I'll explain why. In a minute, I'm going to explain why Thailand changed its name. But the other thing is, I love the old Thai flag. Like, the elephant flag is, like, the coolest flag ever. But I think in World War One, this was before Pibun, they changed to, like, the, the tricolor, like, the French-style flag. And oh, that sounds, that sounds like a Farang meddling in internal Thai affairs, Ed. Well, I'm I'm old school though. <laughs> Here's the really odd thing: the the tricolor flag is Western. I, I want Siam to stick to its own history, like the the, the Thai elephant flag. It's like the, the coolest flag I've ever seen. We got to get a historian on the show to talk about this. Yeah, it's a bit of a divergence. But here's the fascinating <laughs> thing: so 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 Pibun, he gets fascinated by Mussolini. He wants to racially purify Siam. And so him and his uh, minister of propaganda, Wichit, and apparently this was primarily Wichit's idea, they decide that Siam's name doesn't clearly define who the Siamese are. All right. Okay. And so Wichit comes up with this idea that they should change the name of the country to the name of the race. And so the, the, the name Thailand is actually a racist, fascist concept. They wanted to make clear that this, hey, this country is for Thai people. Oh. And, and apparently, even when the country was called Siam, Thai people would refer to it as Mung Thai, even, even before the name Thailand. They wanted to make clear that this country is for a certain race of people. And in particular, and this shows you how weird... Uh, how society can change. In particular, they wanted to make clear that Siam was not for Chinese people. 
So yeah, he had a pretty pretty strong anti Chinese vibe going on. That's right, and and this is the irony of the whole thing because everyone in every, like if you come to Thailand today, and if you know any Thai people. Today, it's a very high status thing for Thai people to be half Chinese. Sure. So today, to have Chinese blood is uh, is a sign of status. But in 1910, 1920, 1930, Thai people were really worried about the influx of Chinese immigrants, and they were really worried about Chinese influence on Thai culture. So it's it sounds so strange if you know any Thai people today. Like in general, I would say Thai culture today is very pro Chinese. In general. Like, it's just, like, it's just p- people are proud of their Chinese history, their Chinese grandparents, and everything like that. Um, hmm. But apparently that was not always the case. So if you do study some Thai history, uh, they were really worried about Chinese influence. And so Thailand was partly called Thailand to make clear that it was not for Indians, not for Chinese. It was for Thai people. And that's doubly weird because Thai, the word Thai, I believe from everything we've talked about on the show with our friends, the um, linguists, Ricker and Stu Jay and a few other people, um, Thai comes from the Thai, T-A-I, race of people who came down to this area of Southern Asia from Southern China. Yeah, of course. So so Piban was actually like the OG of trying to define Thainess. That's exactly right. No, that is 100% correct. You know, fascism is nationalistic. It's like ethno-nationalistic. And um, it tends to be obsessed with the idea of purity and trying to cleanse a country of like foreign influence, you know. And so he he definitely, uh, along with uh, Witchet, they were trying to define what it means to be Thai. And um, it, eventually, I think in 1940, they did obviously change the name to Thailand. And apparently, they kind of did it out of the blue. You know, it was like they just announced on like a Friday. Okay, the country is now called Thailand. Isn't that funny? FYI. Yeah, it, it, like it wasn't like okay, let's have a referendum, let's vote. It wasn't like okay, we're you know they didn't announce like okay, in five years we're going to change the name. <laughs> Apparently, they just announced we're changing the name of the country. He also decided to that Thailand needed a national dish, and Evo and I did a show about this back in season two. But this is where Pad Thai comes from because he's like, hey, we need a national noodle dish. And um, Pad Thai was willed into existence. Ah, very interesting. Like I said, this guy is just an unusual guy. So some of the things he did, in a way, you could uh, I look at them and I say, okay, that that's kind of good, or you could you could consider it progressive. Like uh, he wanted to modernize Thailand, and so w- what he tried to do is he tried to like discourage people from wearing like super old school Thai clothes. People were like still eating with their hands and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, thought, indeed, indeed. Basically, they the, the Thai government started to try to educate people like how to use the, like like a fork and a knife, like how to dress, how to stand in a line, how to queue up. <laughs> still working on that. You know, but here's the weird thing. Here, here's the, here's the contradiction. So even though he's trying to define what it means to be Thai, a lot of his modernizations were clearly Western. They issued pamphlets. You can see these pamphlets online. And the pamphlets told men and women how to dress properly. Right. Because back then, if you were like a lot of women, if they wanted to go old school, traditional tie, they would go topless. They would wear a sarong type thing around their waist. And they would just walk out with with their boobs out. But the weird thing is the fashion that he recommended was not. Thai. It was actually Western. So, like, he he recommended uh, he th- they had a government guideline that men should wear hats, like a bowler hat or something. Yeah, it's like it's really it's a very strange thing because he was trying to he was a Thai nationalist, but he was actually very into European culture, like particularly Italian culture. Like, apparently, um, he really had a fascination with Mussolini, and um, you know, Mussolini used cinema a lot. You know, like all the mm-hmm. like Germany, they they all use like cinema, and apparently, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned last week that uh, you know the first Thai cinema is very old in Thailand, right? Um, but a weird yeah. thing is, Pibon promoted cinema because he saw it as a fascist tool, and the Thai government made propaganda films because that's what Mussolini did. Yeah, it was the most effective way to reach people. Like they had, you had the radio, and you get people into big crowds into a single place, and you show them all the same thing. Like there was no TV, so this worked really well. He encouraged all Thai people to speak in the cent- in the central Thai dialect, so all Thai people could talk to each other. 
kind of stuff like that. Like he, you know, he was really trying to define what it meant to be Thai. But at the same time, you know, you know, at the same time, he's like telling them to dress like Europeans. Yeah, that is a bit weird. But something like making people sort of coalesce around a central dialect that kind of if you try if you're trying to sort of add some cohesiveness to your nation, I I, I can kind of see where that makes sense. No, I like it. I'm not I, I don't have a problem with that. Like I, I think that you know, having one language that everyone speaks is an obvious way to hold the country together. Um, you know, as long as I don't know the details, as long as he wasn't like outlawing the use of the northern dialect, as long as he wasn't doing that. Yeah, then, that's no good. You know, you know, that's no good. But if he's just saying, hey, all Thai people should speak the central dialect, I, I, have, I have no problem with that. That's a good way to hold the country together. But the, the story gets even weirder because, of course, the Japanese are expanding in Asia. And essentially, the Japanese want to get to Burma so they can fight the British and, and, and the right. Americans. And, of course, Thailand is in the way. You know, So Thailand has had this problem throughout its history that it's often stuck in between superpowers. You know, so in general, Thailand is in between China and India. It's also in between like British Burma and what was French Cambodia. You know, so it had it had like a, a British colonial power on one border. It had a French colonial power on another border. Right. Thailand always seems to be like stuck in between. You know what I mean? Um, right. And so the British are in Burma and India and Malaysia and the Japanese are expanding and they want to get all they want to get all Europeans out of Asia. And so basically what happened is the Japanese I think more or less gave Pibun an ultimatum. Like they basically said like we're either going to enter Thailand peacefully or we're going to enter Thailand like violently. Like so either way like we're coming in. And um from what I read um and I do want to I do want to mention a couple books. I know I know that Greg you're familiar with some of these but uh, I'm no expert on Thai history, but there's two well-known books on Thai history. One of them is called uh, Thailand, A Short History, and that's by a guy named David Wyatt. Uh, and then mm-hmm. the other one, even a little more famous, is just called A History of Thailand. And that's by Chris Baker and Pasuk Pongpachit. And I, th- I think that they are, they're married. Is that right? Are you familiar with the, the, the them? Yeah, they're, they're husband and wife as far as I know. And I've read that book. It's very good. Yeah. Um, so these are these books are are um, a little bit academic, so they're not like uh, like a super light read, uh, but they're not super hard either. And so I would recommend both those books. And Greg and I will make sure there's a link um, on the website. Um, but but essentially, right. what happened is uh, P. Boone had to make a judgment call. Like, d- 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 did he want to support the West, like the British and the Americans, or did he want to support the Japanese? And um, Apparently, uh, from what I've read, like the Thai government was basically split, you know. So uh, up until that point, the Thai government had been very pro-West and Thailand actually fought on the side of the allies in World War One. But apparently in in 1939, 1940, uh, Pibun made the decision that he just thought Japan was going to win the war. You know, there's a couple there's a couple of famous quotes where he basically said, like, we're against whichever side is going to lose. And uh, so the the, the Pibun faction in the government, the prime minister and his people, they decided to support Japan. They ended up declaring war on the U.S. and Great Britain. And they allowed Japan to come in and occupy the country so they could get to Burma in order to fight the British. Um, And and part of the deal was um, that essentially Thai troops did not have to fight against uh, the British. It's, it sounds it sounds so weird when you say it like that because you don't hear that a lot. Like Thailand declared war on the United States. That is correct. Now there yeah. are some technical legal issues with that, which like I'll talk about later. But at least the the, the Thai Prime Minister, we can say, declared war on Britain and the U.S. and they were allied with Japan and helped Japan during the war. And by extension, then of course there would be Italy and Germany as well, right? That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and then another part of the deal was that. Japan agreed to help Thailand um, gain back territory that it previously had lost. Essentially, the, the, the dominance of the Japanese gave Thailand an opportunity to try to get land back that it had lost. So I think, I think what uh, Pibun did is I think, I think the Thai army did invade parts of like northern Burma and try to get land back that like Siam used to control. 
a lot of people don't know that. It's like the borders of Thailand actually changed uh, in uh, around yeah. 1940. Well, taking that a little bit further, that conflict was actually called the Franco-Thai War. And it was fought between 1940 and 1941. And that was where France's influence in Indochina, which is now Laos and Cambodia, was really on the wane. So uh, they were on the sort of on their back foot. And then Thailand, with the help of Japan, came in there and sort of started kicking ass. And they won. They had, a, had several important victories. And actually, the Victory Monument, the famous Victory Monument traffic circle, that's what that monument is celebrating, is the victory of Thailand over France in the Franco-Thai War of 1941. That, that, that's exactly right. Um, it, right. It, it's, it's just a weird time. And now, a lot of people don't remember it because basically it's going to get reversed. You know, it's going to get reversed like in a couple of years. Um, yeah, the control z that whole thing. Yeah, that's right. It was a control Z. But, but it, it was a period, <laughs> you know, it was a period, it was a period where it looked like Japan was going to win the war. Like this was Japan's dominant you know, period. In like 1940, 1941, you know, Japan was like winning, basically. But what happened is that the Thai government was actually split from the very beginning. And what happened in Thailand is there basically were two factions. So even though like the prime minister and officially the Thai government was pro-Japan, big chunks of the government were actually uh, pro britain and pro-america so there were two factions mm. uh and the pro-american faction was led by the civilian guy i mentioned earlier pretty bottom young so essentially there was like a rivalry between the civilian faction that led the 1932 coup and the military faction that that led the 1932 coup the military faction led by Boon ended up being pro-japanese the civilian faction led by pretty bottom young ended up being pro-West. Um, and what right. happened is um, the pro-Western faction, they basically engaged in a, some sabotage and some like espionage. So essentially the Thai government was was not unified. It was actually kind of fighting against itself. Like So members of the Thai government were like helping Britain and America at the same time that other parts of the Thai government were helping the Japanese. It was like a period of a lot of like underhanded maneuverings and there was a lot of spying going on right. at the time. I think the pro-West faction was called the, the Sari Thai, which I think it means free Thai. The Sari yeah, Thai. Yeah, Sari Thai. Yeah, the Sari Thai. They were like the pro-West faction. Um, yeah. And from what I can tell, what happened is that essentially when the, when the war began to turn against J Japan... The P. Boon faction, even though he was prime minister, they basically kind of lost power. Um, and according to um, uh, Chris Baker's book, even P. Boon himself was not actually really pro-Japan. He was really a Thai nationalist, and he wanted to do what was better for Thailand. So uh, apparently, as the war started to shift, even P. Boon himself, uh, they think, gave some help to Britain... In America, you know, even though like so uh, officially he was supposed to be pro Japan, but as soon as he saw that the West was probably going to win, he kind of he kind of switched sides a little bit himself. Yeah, yeah, the, the, it's a little bit sort of fuzzy of exactly what happened, but when the writing was on the wall, like when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and right, you know, and and Germany marched into Russia and then ran back. <laughs> right, he was like, "Oh, damn, this yeah. isn't looking good for the Axis." Basically, he made the wrong call. Like, he made a judgment yeah. call of who was going to win the war, and he made the wrong call. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but because of that declaration of war, parts of Thailand, including Bangkok, were bombed by Britain and America. And it's interesting because when I was prepping for the show, I knew that Thailand had been bombed. Obviously, there's the famous bombing uh, on, on the bridge in Kanchanaburi, the bridge over the river Kwai. Mm -hmm. So we know that that bridge was bombed by the British. Um, and I, but I knew that parts of Bangkok had been bombed. I thought like there were just a few. Like I thought that, uh, like I, 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 I didn't. My understanding was like the U.S. and Britain like dropped a couple bombs on Bangkok. But according to uh, uh, the the history books I mentioned, there were actually thousands of bombs dropped. Bangkok was actually like pretty thoroughly bombed. Uh, I think the Chris Baker book said that like sixty percent of the population of Bangkok had to be evacuated. Yeah, it got hit pretty bad. It was a big deal. And the Allies actually tried to bomb um, Sapanput, the memorial bridge, 
but they missed. They couldn't get it. Oh, really? And that's why it's still existing today because it was, it was, I think it was Bangkok's first bridge, first permanent bridge across the river. And they tried to bomb it and they couldn't hit it. I didn't realize how extensively Bangkok had been bombed. I didn't know that. Yeah. And you know, if you go down to Asia Teak right now, um, right along the road, along Charing Krung Road, you can see a bomb shelter that dates back to World War II. Still an original bomb shelter. It's like, it's like it's like the size of a sort of a small condo. It's a, a circular structure with a roof, but you sort of go down a few stairs, and it's, it's basically just a pit in the ground with a cement roof over. It stinks like piss. It's gross, but um, oh, cool. it's an interesting cultural artifact, no doubt. Well, just to show you how like politics rules everything, you, you would think. So you would think like, okay, Thailand declared war on. Uh, you know, the U.S. and Britain, you would think that when the war was over, like Thailand would immediately become an enemy of the West. They would be occupied like Germany and Japan. But actually, it didn't play out that way at all. Because what happened is that the pro-West faction, um, as soon as the war kind of like tipped the other way, what basically happened is Pibun kind of just laid low. I think he kind of went into exile. I, 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 I couldn't find the information. I'm not sure if he left Thailand, but basically Pibun just kind of like disappeared. Like, like you know, it's just like, oh shit, I made the wrong call. And he just laid low. And, I, and, and, and the faction that supported the U.S. basically took over the Thai government. So pretty Bonham Young, Seni Pramot, who was the Thai ambassador to the U.S., he will come back and become prime minister. And essentially, like the half of the Thai government that was pro-West, they become the government of Thailand after the war. Mm -hmm. And right. here's the really weird thing. Um, Priti Banamyong, who is the founder of Thammasat University, he convinced the U.S. and Britain that Pibun's declaration of war was not legal under Thai law. Wow. Uh, the argument was this. Under the Thai constitution, you needed three signatures to declare war. You needed the signature of the prime minister, so that's Pibun. You needed the signature of like the president of the parliament, and he signed. But the third signature is supposed to be the signature of the king. But here's the wild thing. Like we said before, the king wasn't in Thailand, and so under Thai law, the regent is supposed to sign. And the regent at that time was pretty Bonomio. Wow. And he never he never signed the declaration of war. There was no like third signature. And so essentially pretty made this kind of legalistic argument to Britain and America that said Thailand had actually never declared war on them at all. Wow, it's like two commanders on a submarine having a key for the nuclear launch. Like you got to turn <laughs> at the same time. It's That's a right. great failsafe. Um, and I, and I, here's what I think. Um, I don't really think that legal argument was the was the key deciding factor. I think what happened is Britain and the U.S. decided that they needed Thailand as an ally, and essentially the pro West faction took over the Thai government, and they basically. But, you know, immediately Thailand and the U.S. and Britain became kind of close friends, quote unquote, where the U.S., I think, had a, a pretty strong hand in Thai politics after World War II. Yeah, it came in handy, too, when the Cold War would rise up and then communism was a big threat in Asia, too, because Thailand was a major a major ally for, for Western forces in Asia against communism and then gets into the mess of the Vietnam War. It's messy, man. Asian history is messy. Well, that's the other weird thing about this story. There's a whole second chapter to the story. And basically, again, this is in a nutshell, Pretty Bonham Young, uh, I believe, was acting as prime minister. And... Um, uh, Pretty and Seni, they had a lot of uh, enemies in the military faction that they had defeated, like the, the pro-Japan faction that had lost. Um, and essentially what happened is this pro-Western faction of the Thai government, they were blamed in some indirect way for the death of the king. Hmm. Um, and what it meant is that Pretty Bonham, Bonham Young had to leave Thailand. So he had to go into exile. So now that faction is on the out, and Pibun and Songkram, he came back <laughs> out of exile. Like, he came back and became prime minister again, and he was prime minister for, like, 10 more years. Right, right. He got, like, a second run, even though he was wrong about, like, even though he picked the wrong side in the war, it's like he got a second chance. So after the civilian government sort of took over for a while, eventually that 
disintegrated. They left. And then Pibun, yeah, he came back and took up his old position. That's exactly right. You know, it shows you, like, how everything is political. Because when he came back, he basically dropped all the fascist stuff. Thailand stayed a close American ally. I think it was pretty clear then that there that it wasn't a good idea to be a fascist in post World War II. Well, right. I mean, uh, like he his second run was I, I think very different from his first run. Like I think yeah, I kind of kept his head down, didn't he? Yeah. Um, but as you know, Thai politics is messy, and like I said, the Thai military is very political. And so when Pibun was prime minister the second time, there were several attempted coups, weren't there? Yeah, yeah, and I want to go over these real quick, and there's probably a lot more detail here, and I might have missed one or two minor ones, but these are the three major ones that I saw. Um, Really, really interesting. Um, In 1948, there was something called the Army General Staff Plot. Uh, Basically, there was a faction within the government that wanted to do things their way, not Pibun's way, but uh, he was tipped off and he had everyone arrested. Um, In 1949, a year later, there was something called the Palace Revolt, And it was the same thing. The plotters wanted to do things their way. So they seized a radio station and all or part, I'm not sure, of the Grand Palace. But um, they they surrounded, the palace was surrounded, and they escaped over to the Tonbury side of the river, where you and I are at. And the army eventually, there was some street fighting, and the army eventually negotiated a ceasefire. And the third one, and this is actually quite quite a major one, this has happened in 1951, and it's called the Manhattan Rebellion. And... Um, Pibun was taken hostage by junior Navy officers and he was taken aboard a Royal Thai Navy ship. And this is like a real Navy ship. It's not like a massive uh, American or British destroyer, but it's a big warship. Right. Like it's a big Navy ship. Yeah, I think this is just kind of known as like the Navy coup because I, I think what happened is like, I think the Navy staged this coup against the Thai army. You know, it was kind of like a, it was a kind of a Thai military uh like internal dispute. Yeah, yeah, and it gets it gets very complicated, but basically the navy sided or most of the navy or some of the navy sided with the the hostage takers, the rebels. And uh, so they all got they got they got Pibun onto the ship and they they wanted to escape down river and at the at the time this was up near Wat Arun and they wanted to escape down river but they forgot to arrange to have the memorial bridge opened like to lift so the big ship could go through oh really yeah and then the army and the air force and the police um they got involved and they started shelling the ship and eventually it sank in the river everyone jumped overboard gave the order to abandon ship and um Pibun swam ashore so this is crazy now, let's just clarify this. So the Thai prime minister was captured and held hostage by the Thai Navy. The rest of the yeah. Thai armed forces bombed the ship, sunk the ship, and the Thai prime minister swam ashore yeah. on the Chao Phraya River. Yeah, dude jumped off the boat and swam ashore with, like, presumably next to some of the people who were holding him hostage. <laughs> right. So so they got to shore, and, I mean, there was a huge fallout from that. Um, after that, like, the Navy was completely purged. The military or units were, were restructured and sort of arranged more favorably for for his, you know, his, his, his friends to be in charge. Um, there was about 1,500 people were arrested, and when all was said and done, uh, 17 officers, 8 police, and 103 civilians were killed. So it was a pretty big deal. You mean ex- basically executed, you mean? Uh, it's unclear. They were killed. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, probably wow. during the fight. There, there was a lot. I mean, you've got mortars firing on ships. You've oh, yeah. got the army wow. fight, <laughs> fighting the Navy in the streets. So, Wow. Yeah, so talk about, a, talk about a dramatic figure. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure we didn't get every single detail right. But, I mean, I think it, it's safe to say that uh, Pibun Songkram is was not a normal dude. I think we can say that. No, he was not a normal dude. And like you said, I think his second run of the prime ministership uh, kind of was pretty pretty normal. Nothing really rocking the boat there. Eventually, he uh, retired to Japan, and he died in 1964. Wow. Yeah. And a little trivia note just on the end here. Uh, his son, Nid, uh, served as the Thai ambassador to the United States and then as the Thai ambassador to the United Nations. And he died in 2014, just four years ago. Ah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was a really interesting look there. And again, we apologize if we got some names wrong or some details wrong. Um, we, we, you know, this stuff is complicated. Of course, it's it's coming through what we can read on the internet, which is, of course, itself translated from a lot of Thai sources. So 
Um, we're not historians, but uh, he was definitely a very interesting guy. Um, we're not saying whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, but he was an interesting guy. No doubt. You know, so, he, he, you know, he plays a role in the, the, the modernization of Thailand and in the kind of struggle for Thailand to define itself. You know, it's like every country, I think, has to figure out who they are. You know, and there's, I think there's been several figures in Thai history that have really tried to define what it means to be Thai. And uh, I think, I think Pibun is one of those guys. Definitely. Yeah. So fascinating dude. And uh, some really interesting stories. No doubt. I mean, we, any, any one of these incidents, we could have like expanded into its own episode. No doubt. Yeah. I think that was uh, an interesting look into our first, a first show about the history of Thailand. And hopefully we can. Uh, get into some more stories like this in the future. Let us know what you think, listeners. If you thought this was interesting, uh, send us a message and let us know if you want to hear more stories like this about people, about places, about events. And uh, you know, we we find this stuff fascinating. We love it. There's just endless stories like this to talk about. No doubt. All right. Well, since this episode is going real long, we're going to uh, rush into our next segment, and that is going to shake things up a little bit. We're going to play some word association, where one of us says some three words. Or phrases, and the other guy replies with the first thing that comes into his head. And you can play along at home, too. So, Ed, uh, this week I'm going to give you a couple of quick terms and see what see what you can think about them. When they, All right, I'll try, to, uh, I'll try to be spontaneous. First one is Silom Road. Songkran. Like, when I think of Silom, I think of it being shut down during Songkran and, like, the craziness over there. Yeah, that's a good one. I think Siloam is very, very closely associated with associated with Songkran because they shut the whole street down during Songkran, and the place just goes nuts. That's right. That's right. Yeah, good one. All right. Number two, Suwanabumi Airport. Gargantuan. Ooh, that's like my first reaction. Like I, you know, Suwanabum, I do think it's modern, and I've had some very efficient experiences there, but it seems like. 10 times bigger than it needs to be. <laughs> but also sometimes you're like, there's got to be more room to put some more immigration people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get it. You know, the idea I think of Suwanaboom is that it's supposed to be the airport for the next 50 years. So there, it's already over capacity. Are, is it really? No way. Well, pretty close. I mean, you might know yeah. more about that than I do. All I know is that when I go to Suwanaboom, I feel like I, I have to walk five kilometers to like go anywhere or do anything. I mean, it's huge. There's no way it can be the yeah. capacity, dude. It's huge. Let me just do a quick little bit of Google Foo. Um, I'm just looking at a story here from from 2018. Um, they're going to open Utapau, the Utapau Airport, to add capacity because the the, the guy quoted said, um, in order to promote these advanced industries, we need the new infrastructure. Uh, with Bangkok, Suwanapum, and Don Mung airports already over capacity, a new airport is essential. If it actually is over capacity, then that's incredibly bad planning because it's like in terms of the space they have, they have like a huge amount of space there. It is it is gargantuan. That's a great word because it's just huge. If they don't have enough gates or I don't know exactly what overcapacity means. Here's another one. Here's another one. When the airport opened in 2006, it did so at its capacity level of 45 million people. I don't understand that. No matter what you say about the capacity, it's definitely a huge building. If it's gargantuan and overcapacity, then that means it's very poorly planned. TIT. <laughs> All right. Number three. <clears throat> MBK shopping mall. Chaos. Chaos. <laughs> uh, Good one. Like I, I, I like, I do like MBK. It's got some charm. Um, it, you know, it, MBK is like, like an indoor version of the street market. You know what I mean? It's, you know, it, it's, yeah. it has like Warrens and complex areas with like mini stalls. Yeah, a few years ago, I wrote, an, I wrote a blog um, article t- and where I gave each of Bangkok's mall its own tagline. And the one I came up for MBK was, <laughs> even we don't know what's in our darkest, furthest hallways. <laughs> That's right. It's got uh, some twists and turns, and it's pretty chaotic. But I don't know. I mean, like, I'm I'm moderately pro MBK. I think it's got some charm. Yeah, it's like it's like Kaosan Road. It, it's it it has its it has its uses. It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, before we wrap up. A big thanks to all of our patrons out there. Uh, as you know, uh, we don't run ads or have sponsors, so we really, really do appreciate the support we get from our patrons. If you want to learn more, you can head to patreon.com forward slash Bangkok Podcast. And if you want to get in touch with us, we are at Bangkok Podcast on Facebook and Twitter, or you can send us a message 
via the contact form on BangkokPodcast.com. We always write back. If you write it, we will answer it. Yeah, and if you want to find us online, uh, we post each episode there and carry on conversations with our now 300 listeners. You can also reach out to me directly on Twitter if you like, where I am, BKK Greg. So thank you for listening, folks, and we will see you back here next week. So. Well, that was <clears throat> fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez. <laughs> All right, I'll think something. Um.